Well, welcome to Key Yachting's live interactive show, and today we're talking to David McLemmon about the adventures Hi. of... Did I get that right, David? That's perfect, yeah. <laughs> About, about his amazing adventures with his Naughty Tech Open 46 offbeat. Now, many sailors dream about sailing off into the sunset, but don't always make it a reality. David and his wife and law decided to take a sabbatical from work to sail across the Atlantic in the Ark and then explore the Caribbean. We're also joined by Hannah Le Prevost, the sales director of Key Yachty. Hello, hello, Hannah. Hello, David. Hi, hi, Louis. Hi, Hannah. Hello. Yeah. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me to share the adventure. It's been great to spend some time thinking about sailing and adventures, <laughs> even if we can't actually get out in the water at the moment. But, yeah. Uh, and we should yeah, explain that David isn't back in the Caribbean. That is a special <laughs> effect from the McLemon household. Uh, you're actually at home, David, aren't you? I'm at home, yes, but I'd, I'd love to be back in Rodney Bay, which is uh, where the Ark finished in St Lucia, so which is where the, where the photo is. But uh, no, unfortunately, I'm in my in my in my study. Okay, well, you never know. You might inspire some people to pour a rum punch or something while they're watching. I'm I'm having some squash. I'm being a bit boring, <laughs> but uh, and we've also oh, got lovely. Hannah. We've also got Hannah with us from Key Yachting, and if you've got hello. any questions, oh hello, hello Hannah. Hello, Louis. And where are you, Hannah? I'm at home in Hamble. Home in Hamble. The weather's been good, but not as good as uh, St Lucia from the look of it. Not know. quite St Lucia, but it, it could be, you know, it could be much worse. <laughs> well, look, if you've got any questions for David or Hannah, just put them in the comments box as you normally would uh, on a Facebook post, and we'll try our best to answer them. Um, Basically, after the show as well, we'll have a look at the questions. So it might be a, a later thing. And we'll give you an email address if you want to ask uh, some questions otherwise. And uh, this show will actually get a um, uh, recorded and it'll be back, back out on Facebook and YouTube. And you'll be able to see it if you uh, are halfway through or you know someone who's missed it. But uh, anyway, we've uh, just had a quick hello from Simon James. Thanks for checking in, Simon. And um, I think... What do you think, uh, David? Should we should we crack on? I'll uh, I'll switch the cameras round, and here is Offbeat, the uh, the Naughty Tech Forty Six Open. A lot of thought goes into buying any boat. Tell us what were the main considerations for buying the Naughty Tech Forty Six Open for your great adventure, David? I think our, our kind of story probably begins, begins about five years ago because uh, our youngest, Tara, our youngest daughter, was just off to university and we were about to become empty nesters. And uh, we'd also been running our business for about 13 years and felt that we were going to need a break fairly soon. Um, and we, we had lots of yachts and we pulled our first boat in 1990, which is a Sigma 33. Um, and that was kind of pre kids. And um, and Laura and I spent pretty much every weekend racing and, and cruising on that boat um, until the kids came along. And then, um, of course, as the kids then start to grow up, um, end up kind of things happen to many of our animals stop, stop racing and our cruising had become very sporadic. And um, by, you know, I guess um, uh, 2015, we'd, um, we had a, our current boat then was a 35 foot J109, which we'd also bought through Kiyossi and we'd had that for eight years, um, had a great time with it. Um, great racing offshore boat, and I've done four fast net races, but it, it was always a kind of a hassle changing it into uh, cruising mode, and so you know, all the compromises of cruiser races. And so we decided to do some longer distance cruising, um, but looking for the right boat. Um, we, we fairly quickly decided that Catamaran was going to be a great way to go because, uh, you know, really relatively wind cruising, a lot of your time to anchor or marinas, and um, when you're at sea, the stability on the cats is fantastic. But, um, we had some fairly poor sailing experiences on charter cats in in the Med and in the Caribbean. Um, on, and on so, other boats, this is David. Yeah. Sorry. On, on other on other models. Yes, yeah, so on on the on the kind of the other volume, you know, what probably better known uh, uh, cat brands, you know, and and they're they're all uh, yeah, virtual charter boats. They come from one of the two French uh, other French boats uh, or one of South African. Uh, 
makers, and they all tend to be favouring accommodation versus sailing performance. And uh, I remember we had got very frustrated on the med mm -hmm. chart of where we had to stick the engine on to get the boat through the wind in night airs, and, and so we wanted something that would actually sail well as well. Yeah. But David, you actually built this one off plan, didn't you? You didn't even get to sail this one. Yeah, yeah. So we did a lot of research, and then um, uh, you guys at uh, Curiosity had taken on the North Tech dealership in I think it was 2014 or so, and uh, we've been now for two test sails on the Open 40, which is the baby sister of this boat, and um, once in kind of light airs, and then once in stronger airs, and we were really impressed with it. Um, so in the end, um, we then had a challenge with, with how do we buy the thing, and uh, a year later we downsized the house to free up some capital. We sold the J109 and. And I bought a small J70 sports boat for racing, which is brilliant. Um, and we knew that the larger Open 46 was coming along, so we bought that off plan uh, for delivery in the summer of 2016. And uh, ours is hull number six. So, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen the boat um, before we bought it, but we obviously knew what the 40 was like, and we had a good, uh, good sense of the, of the numbers for the 46 and knew it was going to be a good boat. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's a, a particular slide we're going to go to next. And this is a, a lead into some of the yeah, modifications or things you decided to go for the boat. And this is a, is a great example going for a Code Zero, but also perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the performance of the boat in terms of the hulls. Yeah, yeah, so we had the boat, um, so the boat was delivered in 2016 and uh, we, we then cruised it back in Brittany a uh, little channel crossing back um, and then the following year 2017 we uh, we did again went all the way back around to southern Brittany and the Channel Islands and did lots of cruising so we, we had a really good sense of what the boat was like um, and uh, I then decided to go off and do the arc at the end of the following year the 2018 and uh, so the the, the boat itself, the, the naval architect Mark Lombard, who's kind of renowned for race yachts and performance cruisers, and um, this boat is quite good actually because it shows that you've got very slim waterline hulls, but then you can see this sort of clever flare out above the waterline, which gives you great accommodation uh, in the hull. So it had, you know, a lot of the benefits sort of from accommodation of the, of the more, you know, the, the, the higher volume production cast from you know Lagoon Contempojo at our, um, but. It was uh, not as heavy as those cats. Um, had really good bridge deck clearance, and and um, you know and it, she's a she's a really pretty quick boat. I mean, I think generally we view her as being equivalent to a kind of 55 or 60 foot um, you know, conventional cruising monohull uh, in, yeah. in performance. Um, so she's got a uh, self-tacking jib, which is uh, reasonable. Size, but it's non-overlapping and, uh, and it's brilliant if you're kind of in the Solent and you know, you're able to attack the boat without touching any of the uh, sail controls. Uh, but on a, in lighter airs on a reach or on medium conditions on a reach, um, you, know, you could do it with a bit more power. So the Code Zero uh, is it's actually Andal's favourite sail. It's, it's very easy to handle because it, it furls. Um, and we're, we, the boat flies along with it. I mean, we're usually doing about true wind speed minus one knot on a reach, mm -hmm. and up to about 12 knots of breeze. And uh, we've done some fantastic crossings. I remember once we did Labrack back to Salkham, which is 104 miles, yeah. which we did easily in daylight and averaged eight and a half knots for a channel crossing. On so your very high average speeds is, is all kind of what you get used mm -hmm. to on this on this boat. Yeah, yeah, and um, I know you spent a lot of time. Um, with the boat before the crossing, but if we can just focus in on some of the things that you decided to do to the boat, I know that's the picture of the engine and the generator, but you put a hundred litre water maker on board, didn't you, David? Yeah, we had both pretty well specs um, when we bought it originally, but um, until you really, I think planning to do a, a motion trip, it, it was, you know, we, we spent a lot of time again thinking about things we needed to, to add. And I think broadly the, the sort of the upgrades that we made for the trip were in three kind of categories, you know, safety, comfort and communications, because we were running the business and uh, we knew that when we were going that um, fortunately our business was, was had grown to the point and our management team was strong enough that we were able to take the sabbatical and get out of the business for a while, but I did still need to stay in contact, so I needed to have pretty good, well I need to have phone definitely, I need to have pretty good email bandwidth uh, uh, as well. 
Um, and also, of course, you need that for, for weather forecasting. So, um, but the comfort side was 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 about water. You know, um, the, we put a hundred litre an hour water maker on board because we decided that you know having showers every day was going to be great for morale, and it was brilliant. You know, and of course, you know, we were in shorts and t-shirts, but for four months solid, day and night. Um, and of course, when you do the Atlantic crossing down in the tropics, it's 25 degrees day or night because the sea is 25 yeah. degrees warm. So, but you do get a bit. Bit, bit hot and sweaty down below, and so having showers was great. Um, the challenge was it's good for morale, but we were consuming 150 litres per day of water um, on the crossing, mm-hmm. which is a huge amount. Um, so we decided to kind of go for a, for a pretty well spec uh, water maker. Um, it was also dual pump, it had to support both 240 volts and 12 volts, so it gave us a bit of redundancy okay. uh, in, in, the, in the water maker. Um, but the challenge with it is you need a lot of power to drive a water maker. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put a fair amount of solar on board. I think you see on the photo at the bottom, we've got four uh, 145 watt uh, Solvian um, panels with pretty good spec uh, solar panels. And in the in the channel, that was enough to keep us self sufficient on power, even on passage. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we forget that in in uh, you know France and England, we've got 16 hour days in the summer. But when you're doing Atlantic crossing, you're down near the uh, near the equator, and you've actually only got 12 and a half hour days, and so there's a lot less sun. So, um, and we've also got a lot of kit on board. We've got three fridges, we've got a deep freeze, we've got a washing machine, we've got three large chart plotters, we've got an autopilot, and we've got a sat phone, all of which are on all the time, plus all of our PCs and yeah, yeah. other stuff. Um, so when you kind of do the sums, you realise we we needed more power and. Um, Probably, and, you know, in one of the things I should have done was put, put more solar panels on board. I mean, there's some folks, we, some of the other cats we know had much more solar than us, and they were able to keep themselves topped up even on a 12 hour day, but we were struggling with that. And mm-hmm. I wasn't sure that we could do that, and we needed kind of some certainty. And in the end, we put a Pajero um, generator, which is a very small one, uh, but it was sufficient battery charge, and, uh, charging. It's about six times more efficient than running your engines. Okay. Um, so it was relatively lightweight. So, so that was put on board. Um, yeah, again, nice to keep the battery going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you said it's it's, it's um, really it's cool to not turn really that really engine on, really. isn't it? It's great to not turn the engine on to sail everywhere, and these alternative power sources uh, add to that add to that pleasure, don't they? Yeah, it just uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's just very quiet as well. So we could be running the um, you know the the generator. Um, we tended to, to run it um, you know, when we were having uh, a meal, but sometimes we had to run it in night as well because you know we were consuming quite a lot of power at certain night, and sometimes we just couldn't get through the through the night without and stop up the uh, batteries. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it, having something that's tucked away in the engine compartment, which is massive on the forty sixes anyway, in terms of spare space, there was a better way of doing it. Mm. And, and and you spent something like two years with the boat in home waters didn't you david you know did that work out for you you know was that a good move yeah you definitely didn't need to stay two years i mean uh, i think uh but you definitely need some time to, to know what your boat's about and, and to plan the upgrades and, and i think we could have done it the year before but we weren't ready personally uh to go you know, we, we need to get the right time for the business for us to mm-hmm. to head off um but it certainly meant we knew the boat very well by the time we um, by the time we got uh, you know, by the time, time we set off and, and and there were a bunch of other things we wanted to do you know we, we you know, there's obviously a, a whole raft of kind of safety and maintenance upgrades we we did to the boat as well go through those if you're interested in. um, yeah, yeah. you know you, you and a bit of training you know there's spares for everything you know engine water makers so water pumps but but actually we didn't know much about engine maintenance so you yeah, think right. like putting ourselves on an engine maintenance course was part of it um, learning a bit about um, repairing rigging and, and, and so on. There was, a, there was a lot of stuff, and half the fun of it, well, frankly, was the planning. You know, it was, uh, it was, um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun to plan it. All we had this anticipation of building up for a full year before we actually went. And, yeah. Uh, and that was, that was great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this so you can see all of Gavin, Gavin Howe's, uh, but we've got a bit too much going on in this picture. But here's a, uh, a question from Gavin Howe. Um, what was your average power consumption in amps? I'm guessing for the Atlantic, Gavin. Uh, that's probably what he what he's after. I I can't remember offhand, and I, and I would have loved to have my logbook with me, but it's it's on the boat uh, down in the handle, and I can't get back to it. I was thinking of <laughs> all sorts of interesting questions, but we we did record it um, pretty well. But I, I can say that we were probably running the 
uh, the generator for probably about an hour and a half each uh, each night, which is longer than I'd have liked to have done it, um, and we could probably back, you know, clarify the sums from that. But uh, I think again, there are other ways of doing it. Um, I think again, if I was to do it again from scratch, I'd probably have loaded up as much solar as I could possibly put on the boat, mm -hmm. and I might also have got a um, uh, one of the uh, water water generators. They're quite expensive, but the what and see devices, yeah, but yeah. it effectively gives you limited, your limitless uh, um, power. On, on the crossing, but the downside of it is it doesn't help you when you're actually at the other side, you know, in Anchorage, and where you also, you know, potentially need to top up your batteries. And yeah. so that was the those that was the trade offs, really. Yeah. I think one thing we've learned with solar since even your boat, David, is is you know the technology in that department has, you know, advances almost on a monthly basis, if not quicker. So it's, um, you know, I think even now people could have huge amounts more solar than than you could have at at, at that point in time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you could put double the double the power capacity on the top. I mean, you can see the fact we don't use the middle section of the uh, of the of the Bimini top at all, and, and of course you can now get them so they're surface mounted and you can walk on them, um, so you can use every last bit of space, right. and, and it's definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got another question on power here. Also, a nice one from Simon James um, about the about the art. We'll 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 save that for another slide, Simon. But we will come to that. But um, here we go, uh, David Dunford. Um, yep. Did you consider an upgrade to lithium batteries? Yes, I, mean, I would have loved to have lithium batteries. You can just pump all the power in straight away, um, and rather than having to deal with the, the, the power curves of, of conventional AGN batteries. And uh, it would have been great. Uh, they're obviously still hugely expensive, but mm. and, you know, I think you know, you'd be talking about an extra sort of twenty thousand on the uh, on the cost of boats to put lithium in. But uh, it's definitely the way to go. I, uh, in the end, um, Norsec, uh, we asked the question, Norsec didn't uh, have it as an option at the time. Um, I think the, the great thing now, if you're looking forward a year or two with um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the acceleration in electric cars, that's, that's also going to drive down the cost of lithium and uh, certainly it's uh, okay. uh, something that is worth considering and it, I think it will become the standard way of doing it in a, in a, in a few years' time. Yeah, right. Good. Great, great advice. As I say, Simon James, we'll come back to you on the uh, art question. Um, but um, yeah, we obviously, you know, uh, got some very interesting questions there on power. But uh, we're going to move on to the next slide, which isn't about power. It's about there you are. Uh, uh, just tell us what uh, what that picture is, top left. What's what's yeah, going so, on there? Yeah, um, so so that's actually us in August. Uh, 2018, leaving the handle, um, we we also to get about the arc starts in uh, Brampton area in uh, in November, or the arc plus which we were doing, which is going via Cape Verde to the stopover. Um, and uh, but we yeah, getting there is a long way. I think it's about 1,850 nautical miles on a direct line. I think we took about two 2,100 to get down there. Yeah. Um, and we did that in two two spells. So that was us. I think I was probably taken by Hannah or one of Hannah's colleagues <laughs> as, as we were. We were your leaving party when you left the river. Yeah, so uh, so we got through there holding up our off leg and on the blue top uh, helming, and we were, we were we were kind of feet off the uh, the uh, the old slipway at uh, Hamble Point, yeah. um, waving to the key yachting team. We've done a huge amount of work with us over previous months, helping us with all the upgrades that we've done to the boat, and uh, uh, so at that point we were setting off, and uh, the first leg was from the Hamble down to La Coruña. Um, the photo in the middle at the bottom is uh, so. So we did that with um, myself and Law, uh, Lucy, who who uh, was going to do the art with us, um, and um, my daughter Tara uh, came came with us as well. And so we went from the handle to La Coruña non-stop. Um, that shot of the sunset is um, I think the day before we arrived right, crossing Biscay. We, we had a very windy start to the Biscay crossing and then a very Calm uh, into it as we were right. uh, headed, heading across Biscay on the first leg, and then, then we came back and worked for a month, and then we went back down to uh, we left the boat in Vigo and back, and then spent another two weeks with Mike and Sarah, who were the other couple doing the crossing right. with us. So we had two weeks with them, and we kind of you know, uh, yeah. hopped the day hop down the Portuguese coast down to Cachoeira, and then set across to Madeira, a few days in Madeira. Right. And then down to the Savannah Islands, which is a bunch of rocks you've never heard of, which is halfway <laughs> between Madeira and Gran Canaria. And then the top right photo was us in our berth at Gran Canaria, waiting for the start of the arc. 
Right. And and I know you you've done a lot of offshore racing. Uh, you've done a lot of offshore, but Anne Law hadn't done that much offshore, had had she? What what was that delivery trip? Those two delivery trips like to get down to Gran Canaria for for you and for her? Yeah, we we we've done quite a bit. So we've done that channel crossing, you know, 20, 30 years before on the Sigma thirty three, and we and we've done kind of you know, island stuff in the Caribbean on on uh, on a variety of boats before. So she she's got a lot of sailing experience, but hadn't done much offshore, and it'd been a long time since she'd done a night watch. So so um, I think doing the trip was great for us to make certain that everyone was set up for doing night watches. Uh, same is true with Michael Zera actually as well, and, right. and uh, on, the, on the second trip. Um, and in reality, the the probably the most difficult conditions we had of the whole trip uh, is actually, you know, if, if you're sailing, if you're sailing in the Channel and Biscay, that's actually a lot worse than doing an Atlantic crossing. You know, we had uh, the second night, first night we went through the Channel Islands, which is where the wind took down the French coast, and then tacks went along the French coast, and then we had. 27, 30 knots across the deck um, on a beat um, going round Ushant or inside Ushant down the Chanel de Port. Um, yeah. And that was pretty rough. The first night across Biscay was very rough. Again, wind um, on the beam or slightly forward of the beam until it kind of swung back and dry. So, so pretty mm-hmm. pretty rough conditions, but, but the boat the boat's great. I mean, it really doesn't, uh, it's not, not too difficult. And then after that, for the, for the next kind of 5,000 miles, it was all downhill, downwind. It was, uh, it was easy. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the uh, the the next uh, slide, um, which I believe is taken literally just before you're leaving Gran Canaria to go for the first leg down to Cape Verde. Is that right? That's right. I think we're actually just kind of starting to take the sh- the lines off. I mentioned with this side of the dock, we were the inside boat on that pontoon and. Uh, um, when you go down to do the arc, uh, you, you have to arrive about a week before, and uh, there's a whole set of um, you know, training classes and you know, uh, training on weather, rigging, emergency pair repairs, safety. To do, um, you have a safety inspection, yeah. um, and again, we were really chuffed that we kind of passed that first time. A lot of other people were, um, you know, running up and down to the chandlery for, for the week, adding all the bits that they'd forgotten off the checklist right. and to, yeah. to get sorted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but it's also a good social time as well. You know, parties uh, every other night. You start to get to know some of the other boats. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of lots of mutual sport people on the pontoons, and and of course you've then got this anticipation of the uh, of the start, and um, you know, which is the you know you've done all this effort preparing to get to the start line, and uh, it, it, it was a bit, a bit like actually you know you've done, you've done I know you've done a lot of offshore you know, reward racing, but you know the same sort of thing. You could do the fast net race half the thing is getting to the start line. Uh, you know, doing doing the races. Is the other part of it, and there was a similar yeah. feeling here, but with the uh, the big thing that we were about to cross an ocean, so uh, yes. yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, and Simon James, how many people were on board for the arc? And I'm going to expand that and say, and why did you decide to go with that number? Uh, so the boat's got um, three double cabins on on this. The the port hull is that the whole of that hull is our is our cabin. Um, the uh, then on the other side, we've got two double cabins, uh, so we could take up to six. Um, we wanted to sail with people we we you know, knew well, and um, Lucy's uh, uh, sailed with um, with me for many years, and uh, she had actually done the arc and then across the Pacific with her late husband Jim um, some ten years before, and also on a forty-six foot cat actually, and. Uh, so uh, Lucy was uh, was definitely coming with us. Uh, she was okay. our experienced person, and uh, and then we um, ended up um, thinking who else we would like to go with, and uh, we ended up going with Michael Sarah Wallace, who got the J one two two. We we raced against Mike and Sarah for a decade or more, um, uh, but uh, this is the first time we kind of sailed together. But uh, and of course, we all had a shakedown trip to get there, and, uh, and that was a good number. It meant that we could do fairly easy watches. Yeah. Um, we were doing uh, uh, um, myself, and Laura, and Lucy were doing a, a three-hour watch each night, and yeah. uh, Mike and Sarah were combining, and they were doing a four four-hour watch together. Mm-hmm. Um, so everyone had, everyone got plenty of sleep, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was a good number to do it. Right. Okay, well, we're going to go one slight step back, but I think it's a great question, um, which is from Alan uh, Kresno. 
um, about <clears throat> Biscay beating. I mean, beating in, in general. You don't do a lot of beating the Atlantic going that way anyway. But how exposed did you feel on the helm when beating in rougher conditions in, in Biscay? Uh, I'd probably argue much less exposed I feel than any monohull I've been in before. Um, the, 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 we, we really like the twin aft helms, but they are a bit marmite. I mean, we know lots of people don't like them. And, you know, Nautisek have got the Fly, which has a, a single helm station on top as an option. Uh, some of the cats have a bulkhead mounted single helm station. But the big advantage with the twin helms is that you can see the sails. So if you're a sailor, you know, you, you, you're, you're sitting out there, you can see the sails. Um, it's brilliant when you're docking because you're right next to the pontoon when you come in. So when you're, right. you're coming in single-handed, I mean, I've, I've docked about lots of times single-handed and it's, it's dead easy. Um, but you, you, the, the, the sides of the, um, the the decks are pretty high up on, on you and you, mm-hmm. you're sitting in, a, in an armchair and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, never, feel, never feel exposed. I mean, yeah, yeah there's, there's ways to splash. If you don't like it, just stick it on auto helm and, and uh, go back inside. Uh, you're, you're, you're only ever two steps away from... Uh, the, the shelter of the Bimini, and, and in reality, you know, even even beating in the rougher conditions, we were on auto helm most of the time. Um, yeah. you know, the modern auto helms are, are, are very good, and, and the boat being attached, she, she tracks very straight, so there's not a lot of load there either. Well, well, wonderful, very, very good, uh, very good detailed answer there. Uh, hope you enjoyed that, uh, Alan. Informative. Um, right, so I mean, I'm going to ask you this question now. You know, you're you're just about to set off on the on this great adventure but the first part of the journey um was down to cape verde and just explain what's going on here you look like you're celebrating already <laughs> yeah we, we had this kind of mantra on uh, on board we kept saying it's a ra- ra- rally if not a race but, but of course we are all we are all racers and, and and they do have this little competitive element to the uh uh, to the event, so they do have handicaps, and uh, which are set by the, the organisers by some random method. Um, and uh, we had a, it's about just under a thousand miles from uh, 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 Grand Canaria down to Cape Verde, uh, which we did in five and a half days. First day was right. pretty calm, and then we had um, four pretty good days after that. And, uh, and when you arrive, you know, there's an empty marina there, and they kind of line you up, and you you come in, and uh, we were the first cat in. Um, which is great, and uh, there's a very competitive group of five strapping German lads on a Lagoon uh, 450 that came in uh, about uh, 12 hours after us, I think, and uh, we've been really pushing it very hard. And uh, uh, so we were delighted when they had the prize giving after, I think, mean, four, three or four days after everything arrived, there was a prize giving, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, we won the, uh, the, the award for, for first on handicap on the leg, uh, the leg down there. So it was, of course, a pretty decent celebration. Yeah, team team morale looks good there. I'm going to say. Yeah, and by that time, I mean, it's, it, the great thing about the art class is that the the, the art code, the main group just goes direct from uh, Grand Canaria across to St Lucia, and uh, um, the big advantage from the art is you do this week or five days, you know, five days for us, it was up to eight or nine days for some of the slower boats, um, and then we had another five days. For us, uh, waiting before the restart, and you get to know lots of other people, so it really was very, very sociable. And, and you've, yeah. you've been, you've also got trackers on board, so you, so you're getting daily updates about where you are relative to the other boats. Because like any offshore thing, once you've been going for 12 hours, you know, everyone yeah. else is just spread over the horizon in various directions. Yeah. Uh, so you don't see many boats, but there was still a virtual race going on. Sorry, rally going on uh, <laughs> on, on the way on the way down. Okay, well, um, after the Cape Verde is. The huge expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, and um, you very kindly gave us a few little clips and uh, and a few photos of the crossing. Um, you were too busy having a good time to do a uh, a blockbuster movie, but uh, here we here we go. Here's uh, here's uh, a bit of a feel about what it's like, and uh, perhaps we'll ask um, David about some questions uh, once this is finished. Enjoy. <laughs>
broke its boom, one broke a gooseneck, some other pulled a uh, track off, because of course the mile are rolling around all the time, you can see from these shots in the video that we we're, were actually pretty flat and um, uh, even in you know, one and a half, two metre ways. But the biggest challenge is, uh, uh, is chafe. Um, and, uh, so one of the things that we've taken with lots of kind of low friction rings and actually bits of dyneema so we could tweak the way things uh, you know, ropes ran to uh, to avoid um, uh, things you know, chafing, but uh, we had a uh, experimental or a prototype uh, down in sale um, that uh, uh, a North Trade in sale, and it was a prototype, and, and uh, the cable there um, created some chafe, uh, which was uh, uh, which mm -hmm. caused a few problems, um, which we repaired. Um, North got production quality. Cable out to us actually to, to meet meet us in solution at the other end, mm -hmm. uh, but that caused a few few challenges. And we had our spinnaker halyard um, started chafing, right. uh, which we had to go and shorten. Uh, but that was oh, and, and also our auto uh, our echo sounder failed after the leg gas to to uh, Cape Verde. I've been trying to ping the bottom in 2,000 meters or whatever was a bit much for it, and he gave up the ghost. So right. that that wasn't really too much of a problem because you know. Two minutes after leaving the dock track in 2,000 metres, and the same thing on to arrive at St Lucia, so we didn't really need it anyway. Right. Um, but that's about it. I, I mean, I've got to say, you know, what did you log? Two, two and a half, two and a half thousand miles, 18, 25 knots. You know, if that's the only breakages you had, that's pretty impressive as well, isn't it? Yeah, we had some really good. I mean, I think um, you know, Michael Lord had uh, given us some. Uh, um, Oh, is, the, is our sound back on again? That's yeah, it sounds order. back on. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna blame the sound engineer on that one. Right. <laughs> no, everybody can hear you. Don't don't worry. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, we had some yeah good advice. Mary Floyd had uh, had, obvi uh, had obviously done uh, a lot of ocean sailing, and uh, others in the yachting team had kind of uh, said, you know, really watch out for for chafe, and that was again reinforced. Um, at the, uh, at the sessions and with the, 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 the arc ran as well. So you just have to keep checking the boat and, and make certainly moving things around a bit uh, just to, to avoid wear. And, and I think uh, we were, because we were well aware of the issues, we, we, we were okay. Right, wonderful. And, and it's, a well -sorted, it's a well sorted boat. We knew the boat very well. Uh, and Alan Krasno's come back with another lovely, uh, well, very good comment. Um, I'm just going to pull that up on the screen. Um, just bear with me. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the re it's one of the reasons that we chose. So there's a question about slamming. Um, so one of the reasons that we were impressed with the North Tech in the first place, and certainly compared with other cats we sailed, is that uh, the um, the the North Tech 46 has got 80 centimeters of bridge deck clearance, and it's basically the full width of the of the hull. And so we've never had any slamming under the bridge deck, um, which okay. tends to happen most commonly when you're going upwind. Yeah. Um, uh, on on most cats, um, so that's the big advantage. The very slim holes and and uh, you know, uh, bridge deck clearance. Mm -hmm. um, you do get some uh, sort of diagonal waves as you're going downwind that will slam on the back of the hull, right. um, which has happened to everybody. But that was about it. And um, I was worried a bit about the dinghy because you can see from the davits it's relatively low. I think that should be a bit higher now on the, on the latest boats. Um, but yeah. we've done two things to, to address that. You can probably just see on the right hand side of the picture, we, we actually put some straps underneath the, uh, the dinghy to, to make certain that we held it into, uh, held it up so in case the, the um, normal hoist um, failed. And yeah. we'd also created a little um, gantry to take the outboard off, and that's mounted on a bracket on the back of the boat. Um, in practice, um, even on the second and third days out of Cape Verde when we had um, probably four four metre waves and, and maybe bigger, five or so, even potentially six at times when it was really pretty windy, um, we never actually had waves uh, actually hitting the dinghy. We, uh, they'd, um, you know, the occasional one might just hit it. Um, yeah, the base of the boat just rises up over it and that uh, was never an issue for us. Okay, and that's on a, on a windy and crossing with a, with a fair bit of sea state. I know you mentioned Biscay there, but... Uh... That's a that's a very very good uh, practical uh, knowledge there. Um, yeah. I'm going to move on to this slide here, um, and I should explain that David's told me that isn't dockside at some Caribbean island, is it, David? Where where was that picture taken? What was going on? 
Well, that was a typical uh, evening, you know, so uh, we, we, that's in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, so uh, bar the, we have one night of the, of the two windy nights at the beginning, which is the only night on, perhaps since we've had the boat, but we haven't been able to eat in, in the cockpit uh, table. That was, uh, that was our regular uh, sunset, um, have a meal and for one bottle of wine between the four of us. Um, and so we're in 18 to 22 knots of wind, um, one to two metre seas here, and uh, we're eating, I think that's a meal with a mahi-mahi we caught earlier, uh, and that wine bottle is not moving, and those are actually real glass uh, wine glasses. Um, so that, that's the other big plus of, uh, of doing it on the cat. Yeah, 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 got to it there. And, and as I said, 12 days, fantastic, uh, under 12 days, um, fantastic speed. Um, and there is a, a little insert of you crossing the line and the team. What's that moment like? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, we, we sailed um, well over 5,000 miles since we left the handle. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, it's all, almost all been down and sailing. And, uh, and um, the, yeah, it got increasingly squally as we got to, to, to the other end. And in fact, you know, most of those you could see him dodge as he, as he went by. But um, the last day we actually had an enormous squall, about 38 knots of wind, and it was, and we managed to get 21 knots surfing out of the boat. Uh, wow. And then uh, suddenly, you know, Lucia appears, and you, you sail around the back of the island, and, and suddenly you've got to drop your down sails and have a very short beat to the finish. Uh, so that's, that's crossing the finish line after the sort of a, the mile from Pigeon Island up to the uh, finish line in the middle of Rodney Bay. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a great feeling. You know, we've had, um, you know, a real sense of elation and of achievement. You know, we, we crossed the ocean. And we, you know, we've obviously, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a big thing. Um, but, you know, again, we were actually... Over the, you know, we were showered up and um, got, our, got our tops back on and yeah. stayed on the first time I've worn it since. Yeah, so um, you're wearing the shirt, aren't you? <laughs> I only just yeah. noticed that. <laughs> so, well, if you're going back in Rodney Bay, you've got it, haven't you? Uh, yeah. um, and, uh, and then you're, you're met, you, you go into the, to the marina and you're met by the arc yellow tops and straight to the bar. So, uh, fantastic. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to put the. I'm not going to put it up because they're going to move on. But Becky Walford says, and a lot of silliness ahead uh, of being on land. She's uh, yes, yeah, so it was funny really because because yeah. it turned out that they were, we were complaining about the Irish a bit because uh, there was an Irish yacht that we we managed to. Uh, the only time we saw somebody else was was twice in one evening uh, on the second night out of St Lucia. We there's this uh, Irish fifty foot uh, mile hole. But uh, we we had to water course for them, and, and three hours later we both joined back, and we both had to water course for each other. So the first time we passed, we were on the VHF uh, saying we owe you a drink, and oh. and then uh, we did the same in reverse. And uh, of course they turned up, uh, um, you know, some hours after us uh, in uh, in St Lucia, and of course we were straight in the bar together, and uh, yeah. the two drinks ended up being many more than two. <laughs> But you know, here's some pictures. I mean, you know, there's a there's a whole album full. But just you know, give you give an idea. You've got your home from home, offbeat. She's in the Caribbean. You've got your family, you've got your friends, you've got sunsets like that. You get right into bays like that. Just you know, just tell us a little bit about those pictures or what it's like to be in the Caribbean with your home from home. Well, I think if you haven't been to the Caribbean, you've got to do it one way or another, either on your own boat or go and charter or but just to just get out there. I mean, we, we had uh, two weeks or so in St. Lucia with uh, Mike, Sarah and Lucy. Uh, then we had, and then they flew back uh, home. Uh, and Laura and I had a week on our own. We went up to Martinique and back, um, just the two of us. And then our kids flew out and had three weeks with us um, at Christmas in Bequi. Uh, the anchor photo there, I think, is off Superier at the south yeah. of... Uh, of um, uh, St Lucia, um, you know, Christmas in Beckley. We went to Basil's Bar in Mustique, and actually uh, Tara managed to uh, drag Mick Jagger over to our <laughs> table to introduce her. And says, you know, Seriously, I have a photo of that, although I'm not supposed to have taken one of them. Um, then went down to Tobago Keys, which is an unbelievable paradise, really. Um, and then back up the New Year in Marigo Bay, because we had uh, some, uh, um, my cousin and his wife coming out as well, so we had a fair enough number of us on the boat. and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a great, great way to, uh, yeah, great way to enjoy yourself. And, and, and a home from home. I mean, one of the beauties of the of the 46 Open, it's got such good accommodation, hasn't it, that it, it really is a very good long, long-term long Liverpool, isn't it? 
Oh, completely. Yeah, and we're very self-sufficient. You know, we've got our own water maker. You know, get, actually getting water is obviously a challenge usually, but you know, with water maker on board, we, you know, an autumn that made water is, is better than you get from any tap. It's, you know, it's, really, it's really good. Right. Um, you know, we've got a washing machine on board, which is fine. If anything you need to wash with it, you shorts and t-shirts. But, uh, but um, you know, uh, so it's just a question of, of food, and, and we, we have, yeah. you know, uh, obviously eating ashore and you know. And the local, you know, uh, vegetables and so on and so forth. It's, it's very easy. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, an interesting group of photographs. Um, Dominica was badly affected by Hurricane Irma in 2017. It, it, these pictures are taken about a year and a bit later. Just tell us what what's going on there in Dominica. Yeah, we didn't really know much about Dominique until we arrived, and at the, the end of the arc, um, the arc organisers came around and, and asked if we, you know, like all the boats, we had lots of medical stuff on board and drugs and you know stuff that uh, um, we, we we didn't need, we hadn't got there, and they were collecting up these medical supplies to go to uh, Dominica, and uh, it actually it was actually Hurricane Maria, which was two weeks after, and Irma hit some bars in St Martin in the Virgin Islands, and then. In middle of September, only two weeks later, uh, Hurricane Maria, which is another Cat 5, had a direct hit on Dominica and it literally yeah. ran straight up the island and uh, um, it flattened nine times in the buildings, all the roofs were removed and some of the photos you can see there are still tarpaulins on the roof and USA um, you know, uh, kit covering stuff up. Um, you know, a year, up, you know, year and a bit later, the trees were flat and all the vegetation was you know, stripped and most people were homeless or had homes that were badly damaged and we didn't really know the story. Mm. Um, so the, they took the, the drugs from us, we then flew back and worked for another month and then when we went back out again, we managed to hook up with um, an uh, English charity called Help the Dominica and um, we spoke to them and the, the biggest one of the challenges they had uh, was getting the schools going again. And so, we we went and bought some supplies. We had um, you know, people in our company um, uh, raise money and, and got a bunch of school supplies, which we uh, mm -hmm. could, given we'd gone back with uh, leaving most of our clothes on board. We had you know, we took two empty suitcases out on the uh, uh, full of full of um, stuff for the schools, and right. uh, that's um, Joe Dobney, the girl in the blue top, and that's her husband. And we live on the island in Rousseau, and uh, we 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 delivered the uh, some supplies to help the uh, the local schools and. Um, and the cruisers are now getting back there, and uh, it's, the island's actually fairly poor because it's a very steep uh, volcanic island. It doesn't have an international airport, doesn't have many hotels, so the economy is pretty limited, and that, and that really helped. With, you know, so there's a struggle from getting going, and uh, it's really important that the cruisers go back there. And it's, and it's a beautiful island, so it's well worth right. a little trip. Uh, good, on, good on you. Um, and, and here we are again, just some fantastic images of your adventure in the Caribbean with Offbeat. Just, just tell us about those times. I, I think, I think when you get to the Caribbean, the, you've obviously got the the islands like you know Saint Lucia and Martinique and Guadeloupe, which are uh, pretty well developed. We've got lots of international hotels, and and many people go out there for, for holidays. But the big advantage if you're a cruiser is you can go to these places that nobody else gets to, and uh, um, and then, you know, we love the Grenadines, you know, the the island south of uh, Saint Lucia and Saint Vincent, going down to Grenada, and we we sell that area several times and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and and equally this time we ended up going all the way north up to um, uh, uh, Antigua so we also went to Guadalupe and we along to, uh, on the way up and and uh, the, the great thing about being being you know, a cruiser is, is you'll be in places that nobody else can get to and uh, yeah. that lovely sunset shot was actually um, there's a bar on a reef uh, near Union Island, just near, just near Clifton Bay, and our, our yacht is off being is anchored about 200 metres away. And uh, on the reef, uh, an entrepreneurial local is, um, which has taken a load of conch shells and built an island. And the bar's been there for at least 20 years, because it was there you know, 20 years ago when I first went out there. And uh, uh, it's now expanded, and, uh, and you can go and take your dinghy up onto this dock. And uh, of course, the great thing about uh, all of those part of the Caribbean, is, or the shelter side is always facing west, so you always get a sunset every evening. And uh, this was a very, was a brilliant uh, French kite surfer who was coming and buzzing the uh, uh, the bar we were yeah. sitting at. It. But uh, we had yeah, so many fantastic sunsets, as you can see from the other photos as well. Um, another question from uh, Alan uh, Krasno, which uh, I think I'll um, put up. Um, here we go. Hey, Con. 
Yeah. Um, not, not, no, no, we don't know regrets on that. I mean, obviously, Tokens used a huge amount of power, and uh, we did put some, we didn't have fans on the board as standard. We put in the Sorocco Caframo uh, fans, which are really good quality fans, in the cabins for saloon. Um, and uh, and the the good thing about the crossing is that there was always breeze. Uh, mm-hmm. It was warm down below, but the fans were, were good enough. Um, uh, but the, the power impact of aircon is huge, and so and this one on generators all the time. I think the great is sort of stuck in the marina in you know, the eastern seaboard of the United States or somewhere where there's no wind. But I, I, we don't we didn't really miss it, and, and we've done quite a bit of sailing in the Caribbean before. Med, med again in, in, in summer might be useful, but um, which is where you are, and so uh, you know, slightly different situation. But okay. uh, certainly for our project, it wasn't really an issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, we're sort of coming near the end. This isn't the end of the show, I have to say, but there we have um, Offbeat going on to uh, be shipped home by Pennies in May. Um, why did you decide to do that? How did it work out? Yeah, so uh, we, we got, we've obviously been out and back a couple of times and, uh, and uh, Mike and Sarah and Lucy have used the boat as well in the times when we were back here working and... Uh, um, so this is almost exactly a year ago, actually. I think it's um, yeah, it was middle of early May that we uh, we had to ship back, and uh, we'd taken the boat up to Antigua, and then um, we, we we didn't have time to sail her back, uh, which obviously take longer. And doing a doing a west piece is is tougher than doing a um, uh, you know less direct than doing a, doing the the the, the east west crossing we've done. And, uh, um, we looked at coming to delivery crew, uh, but when we kind of did the sums, it was about the same cost as shipping her back. And the, the big advantage for shipping her is there's no wear and tear. And um, she she was loaded on a, a ship in um, in Antigua along with I think it was 35 other boats. It's an amazing you know, loading experience. And uh, and then she was back uh, in Portsmouth only two weeks later. So it was uh, it was it was a, a really easy way of doing it, and certainly one I'd recommend. Yeah, wonderful. Well, um, we're going to go on to this slide here, and this is not offbeat. No, this is a new North Step 46 that, you know, obviously we're, we're the dealers for here in the UK um, and Ireland, and much like her sister ship that, that went off on Davies Adventure, um, it's got exactly the same hull design. Slightly different interior, but it's ready for somebody who wants to start their adventure now. Um, and it's, it's located in Hamble at the moment and ready to go. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. And uh, we'll put up the uh, email address. But uh, if uh, anybody wants to uh, contact Key Yachting um, for comments or um, for about the Naughty Tech range, uh, it's info at keyyachting.com and uh, we're going to play out with a little video but thank you very much for tuning in and hope to see you all soon